Welcome to Gotta Run With Will Presents. This is Will Sanchez. I am thrilled to introduce Gotta Run With Will Presents that will cover other aspects of the running culture. And Will Sanchez has done me the honor of asking me if I would uh, host this particular conversation. I'm Roger Robinson, and he's asked me, I think, because of my interest in the history of running, because our topic today is early New York running. And the suggestion came originally from Gary Corbett, who does tremendous work for the early history of running, preserving archives, and especially giving some prominence to African-American runners, like his father, the great Ted Corbett, who I'm sure we'll hear more about because he's an essential part of the history of New York running. Our finishing date today, I'm going to start with that, is going to be 1976, October the 24th, 1976, which is normally the starting date for histories of running because that was when the New York City Marathon went out of Central Park and into the five boroughs of the city. Everybody says that was the spark that ignited the running boom. So if that's when the main running boom, the modern running movement started, that's where today we're going to end. There is one problem or two problems with choosing that date. One is that because that's 1976, I can't mention 1978 when the first run up the Empire State Building was won by one of our guests today who had previously won the first New York City Marathon in 1970, Gary Murky. Gary, welcome thank to the show today. Well, thank you very much. Gary is a runner. He was, in those days, he was a firefighter, and he then became a pioneer of setting up New York's first major chain of running shoe stores, Super Runner Shop. So, Gary, you did a tremendous job with that. And that end date of 1976 also means that I have to leave out much of the career of our other guest, although she did a lot in the early days, but the Avon series, taking, moving from her office in the Avon building on 57th Street and taking women's running out to the world, to Tokyo, to Rio de Janeiro, to London, to Canberra, Australia, where I first met her, um, the great pioneer of women's running, and also now my wife, Catherine Switzer. Catherine, welcome to Thank our conversation. Thanks, Roger. Great to be here. <laughs> Catherine, start us off. Tell us somebody who in the early history of New York running you see as being a major pioneer. Absolutely, Nina Cusick. She's from Long Island, not far from downtown New York. But she was a great runner, coming from roller skating, which is another story which I'll tell you in a minute. But um, she also was a great pioneer because she helped do so much legislation and real technical work to get women official in running. She was fantastic. The, Gary, the, the, when you won the, the, the first New York City Marathon, Nina ran that day but was sick and didn't finish. Is that right? Uh, yes, and I think her husband ran that race also. Oh, is that right? Yes. Okay, yeah. And but, Gary, you won that, that first race. It was a lucky day. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that just yet. You, you pick, a, pick an early pioneer, somebody who oh, you The knew. only person I can think of is Ted Corbett, 1952 oh, Olympian. Just a person who, when you ran with, when you ran as a competitor against, you never felt that you were competing against him. I can remember getting the feeling, running on the road, when he would start to pull away from me, he would just reach back and grab you and say, stay with me. I mean, that was a feeling, but I'm sure that was exactly what happened. He was such a nice man. I mean, I oh. met him, he was in his later years when I first met him, but he was so kind and gentle and, and had done so much, was so modest about it. Well, he was very, very instrumental in course measurement. Uh -huh. I yeah. mean, I think he was the first one who developed the wheel on the bike and made sure that every course was exactly measured correctly. Yes, yes. He the, was a pioneer in that. At Jones Counter that, that uh, they but, worked out and Ted was important in that, yeah. yeah. Uh, and of course, did a tremendous amount with the Pioneer Club for uh, Af African-American runners and for other runners from yes. sort of minority groups. Sure. How, how were things, uh, Gary, in, 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 in the club scene? In you know, the clubs? Back in those days, you know, when you first started. And the club scene was New York AC, the Milrose, and the New York Pioneers. Mm. And uh, uh, I don't think there was any animosity between any of the groups. I mean, it was very, very... Uh, it was very, uh, it was very good. There was no looking down on anybody in that. It was very equal. Uh, Did you hear of a club called United Athletic Association? Yes. 
Yes, because I contacted a friend of mine who's like me, a New Zealander, and he was in New York in the late 60s. And being a good Kiwi, and, and New Zealanders are quite often you know, very liberal people, he didn't quite like the restrictions with New York AC, that, that, you know, that black guys and even Jewish guys were not allowed to compete for right, them. Right. So he joined United because it was a, he, you know, he'd come and he had a lot of Maori friends in New Zealand, and he joined them because they welcomed everybody. Welcome, right, they do yeah. welcome everybody. Yeah. 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 And, and he even sent me a picture of his old singlet. Which, which the, he's, United which he's, AA. Yes. Another club, St. Anthony's Boys Club. Uh -huh. Milt yes. Paddocky was one of the coaches and one of the guys who ran all the time. I mean, I can remember running one of my first marathons, and uh, he was he was in it. Mm. Uh, yeah, but the uh, United AA. Uh, I just spoke uh, a guy by the name of Revis, who lives on. I heard he was in town the other day. Ah, yes. The one Roger mentioned, Roger Clark mentioned, was. Jimmy Borden. Oh, Jimmy Borden. He was like yeah. the he was like the coach. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. he said there were a lot of uh, uh, Jamaican members, including mm. Byron Dice, who of course was a great Olympian. Oh wow! So, wow. There's, so there's some yeah. talent around. Yeah. And then when I asked you each to name somebody, I had some names as well, and I wanted to get to, to go. I wanted to go further back oh, and just ahead. remind people. And I wanted to say, and I, uh, uh, this is a fictional name, but it's important. I want to mention Magua. And Magua is in Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans. He's, of course, he appears as the villain in the, in the relatively recent film, but he's an Indian runner, as they call it. He was one of the messengers. And we should remember that the, um, the, the Native Americans in this area were not a horse culture. They were a water and then a running culture. And a lot of those early runners were, were messengers carrying messages up, up into the hills, up into the, uh, the Adirondacks and the Catskills and so on. And somebody like Magua, who's a fictional character, were doing a lot. I just wanted to mention them because they actually were, were doing a lot of running before any of us were here. <laughs> so, and, and we're doing it pretty well. And then there was Lon Myers. And Lon Myers was a great 400 and 800 runner, as we'd call it now, of the 1880s. And they invited across the top English runner, Walter George, of that date, and they had a three race series, which was sold out. I and mean, they got, they filled Madison Square Garden. And they had these, they had these three. We just, we should remember that running was actually a very big spectator sport. And Did a you, betting sport. And huge betting sport. <laughs> Is that right? And then, and, and then you got that whole series after the London Olympics in 1908, when there was such a huge uproar over the collapse of uh, disqualification of Durandu Pietri. And then, as I wrote somewhere, one of the laws of nature is that if there's a buck to be made, there will be somebody in New York to make it. <laughs> and this guy, Pat Powers, who is an entrepreneur, a sports entrepreneur in New York, he got Durando Pietri, the Italian, and Johnny Hayes, the American, and Tom Longboat, the Canadian, and Alf Shrub, the English, and he got them together for this series of races. They'd, have, they'd go head to head, and they would fill Madison Square Garden. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And Shrub said he got beaten one time, and he said it was because the whole place was full of cigarette smoke and cigar <laughs> and, and, and I could, and it was mobs. And they had Italian bands playing, and, and Irish bands playing, and the fans fought each other, and the runners couldn't get through because it was such a mob scene. <laughs> We've got to remember there was a lot of vital running in, going on in New York, how many how many track meets were there in oh, New York? Amazing. I mean, Hundreds. Knights of Columbus, yeah. the New York AC, Milrose, and there was another yeah. one also. And the first ever marathon, other than the Olympic marathon in 1896, was the New York Knickerbockers put oh, no, club yeah. put on a marathon that went from Stamford, Connecticut, and ended at a track meet at Columbia. No kidding. Track. But Columbia oh, yes. University. Mm, Columbia track. University track, yeah. and and they finished in the course of the track meet. And they'd done about 25 miles, so there, there again was a significant, and again, they, they got huge crowds along the roads for them. Did you two. see the, the new race up at the Armory? Oh, that was going back to these indoor marathons. I mean, the indoor marathon. Great idea. Yeah. With, with teams of eight people running, I mean, it, all the law firms, I mean, there was quite a few law firms in it. I think it's gonna be very, it's gonna grow <laughs> tremendously. Yeah. Because it, in those days it had tremendous appeal, and of course I was really pleased as a historian to see that older history of New York running itself being almost. revitalized. Yeah, yeah. So, so because we we have tended to think, and it's quite natural, we've tended to think it all started in 1976. Well, our <laughs> job today is to say it didn't, and that that's no disrespect to the importance of what happened in 1976. 
but let's let's look back and see what was going on. Catherine, what about the, the women's seat in New York? Like, actually, before you came to live here, you had dealings with Fred Levo, didn't oh, you? Oh, absolutely. Mm. I mean, everybody had dealings with Fred Levo. <laughs> So I was a, a student at Syracuse University, and, and then after I graduated, um, I ran the Boston Marathon in that confrontational incident in 1967. And he screamed, get the hell out of my race. And I was a junior at Syracuse University, so carried on there and then formed the Syracuse Track Club. And we were very, very outspoken about women's running, as were all the New York clubs. And so the AAU was, was being the restrictive West with us, but the Roadruns Club of America always said yes, where the AAU seemed to always say no. And there were all these rigid requirements for, for women's events. And, and the RRCA said, well, you, you can come along and run with us. It's no problem. So New York seemed to be really the most go-ahead place in terms of pushing the women's mm. cause. Um, and so certainly in, in 19... 70, 71, we would all come down from New York in, in cars and, and run events here. And I'll never forget the first time I met Fred Lebo was in the Earth Day Marathon in 1971 in March. And we're running around Central Park, freezing cold. And I had terrible side stitches. I'd eaten a steak the night before, and it was cold. And, and, and I was practically last, and the police kept wanting me to, to give up, and they would take me to the finish. And, uh, and somebody was yet behind me, plodding along, and it was this little guy in a bicycle cap and he came up Gary and he, he put his hands on my side and was rubbing my uh, who was side it? stitches. Well, of course it was Fred Lebo. And he was helping helping me out. But as you know, Fred Lebo, I'm sure, was trying it on. Um, <laughs> That's right. But, but anyway, we finished it. We finished the marathon together. But um, after that, you know, we became friends and I, I gradually got to know a lot of the New York people and they we communicated all the time back and forth uh, from Syracuse. Then I, uh, when I moved here, um, in 73, by that time, um, you know, I knew Nina, I knew Pat Tarnowski, these women who were very active because we'd been running the Boston Marathon together. But, sorry, just to roll back, yeah. you, you moved to New York in 73, mm -hmm. but the first mini, yes. the, which you could tell us about, yeah. was actually 72. So that was before you actually were actually living in New Absolutely. York. Absolutely. But there's even more of a back history to that, Roger. I mean, Nina Cusick, for instance, uh, was really working very hard on legislation. Well, we all were. She was chair of Women's Long Distance Running New York. I was chair of Women's Long Distance Running Niagara. Pat Taranowski was helping us get our, our, our public relations and our work together. Um, Vince Cipetta, Aldo Scarandura, all of these guys were helping us get our legislative work together. Then Nino happened to be an extremely good runner also. And in, in there was sort of a crunch in 1971 when we were very feisty at Boston. People were looking for the first two women to break the world record, but Nino also was gunning to be the first woman under three hours. Mm -hmm. And Fred set it up in the New York City Marathon that year with her and Beth Bonner to, to be the first women under three hours, which is gonna be a very, very big deal, okay? Um, but then two weeks before, we found out that Adrian Beams from Australia mm -hmm. had run a 2.42. Wow. We couldn't believe it. Wow. We thought it was a hoax. Nina and Beth both went under three hours. For a long time, they were considered the first women under three until we found out that Adrian's race really was valid. Mm -hmm. um, at least the performance was valid. So then we rolled into Boston 72. And again, don't forget, New York and the women here were really pushing to get equality for women at Boston and in all marathons. It just happened to be that Boston was the first one that had to capitulate and accept women. Um, the AAU had passed the, the, uh, the, the legislation. So here we were at Boston. We ran, um, none of us ran particularly well that year when we had run much better the year before because it was hot but we still comported ourselves extremely well. Mm. But it made headlines. It was like people never knew women could run a marathon. Yeah. And after that came the inspiration for the New York Mini. Yes, can we, can we just uh, cut, cut into that mm -hmm. a little bit? Because then Gary was kind of involved to an extent in that, or would have been, would have been witness, because the women, Nina was allowed to run in 1970 in New York, mm -hmm. uh, but though she didn't finish because she was ill. And then she did finish in 71, didn't she? And then 72, they had their sit-down, Gary. Were you there when they sat down oh, at yes. the start of the race? My wife was there on, was sitting down. Oh, she was one oh, of the oh, sit-downs. One of the sit-downs. Oh, they, right. they were recruiting anybody. <laughs> any woman had any interest in the race. Uh -huh. Yeah, my wife was on the line with uh, with Liz Franceschini, yeah. who was second in New Pat York Barrett, City at one year. Nina. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what happened? They were they maybe, sat they, down. They were told they had to they run. They had them run 10 minutes, ten minutes they had ahead to start of the men. 
Mm. Ten minutes ahead of the men, so they sat down for ten minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. The AAU had said we had to have a separate start for the men. Yes. And at Boston, <laughs> they just had us off to the side. Uh -huh. Big deal. Okay. But New York suddenly said you had to run ten minutes ahead. And so the women staged the sit-down strike. So that was actually after the Boston Marathon. Yeah. But, but here's what happened is, is that in Boston, we created headlines. And a sponsor came to Fred Lebo. And it was Johnson's Wax. And they had created a lady shave cream called Crazy Legs. It was pink. It was edge, painted pink, okay, and perfume, all right? And they thought this is going to be a great product launch. And so they came to Fred with money. And Fred said, oh, my God, we've got to do this race. So Nina, Fred, and I sat down, and we started putting this together. And we'd run all over New York with flyers, and we only had six weeks to pull this whole thing together. In the end, Fred said, we can't have a marathon. We've got to have a mini marathon. He was in the garment trade. Let's call it the mini because it's a short marathon, and the mini skirt's in fashion. Mm -hmm. One loop around Central Park. Seventy-eight women showed up. And um, that was huge. We couldn't believe we had 78 women. Fred was so desperate for publicity and, 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 and women to run, um, he went to the Playboy Club and recruited these bunnies and said that, you know, if they came out in their bunny ears and their boots and their shorts, that they would um, get all this publicity. And, and it's free entry. <laughs> free entry in the race. Well, and of course, there's a story this. Now, this is the original shirt. Mine says number two on it, right? Nina wore number one because okay. she was the number one ranked woman runner. But now... Here's the point, is Fred had these shirts printed with our bib numbers on it so that we had to wear the shirt. Well, oh. you see, so about 10 of us knew that this was against AAU rules to wear advertising. And we were screaming bloody murder. And so Fred said, oh, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. Bullshit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we all wore the shirts. And, of course, they got terrific publicity from this thing. And, and to jump ahead a little bit with this, um, about 10 of us knew that we were going to get in trouble, might get in trouble with the AAU because we were wearing a shirt. We, we couldn't not wear the shirt because it was our bib. All right, so we had an excuse. It wasn't our fault. But the rest of the women, let's say 65 women, okay, didn't even know about the AAU. They, they were there to They wouldn't care about the AAU. Yeah. They, they were there, there just to run. run. And, and so in a way, what we saw was a glimpse of what we're seeing. That was now. the beginning of the modern that world. That was the beginning yes. of the modern world. Yes, where most runners... Yeah. <gasps> Most of you, if you ask 90% of, of the yeah. runners in Central Park what uh, USATF is, they wouldn't have a clue. Absolutely. Or, or and great, great. And they too. wouldn't care. Yeah. And they That's wouldn't right. care. And why would they? Absolutely. It's and <laughs> this was also the beginning of the inspiration to get the women's marathon in the Olympic Games because yeah. we saw that women would want to run if they had a welcoming environment where, where they could come and have fun together as well as train hard together. It's hard, isn't it, Gary, you know, for people of our generation now to tell people modern runners, what it was like when you were looking over your shoulder at the, at the at Federation the AAU, of Water. At yeah. the AAU, yeah. telling you you had to get a, a, a permit to go run someplace. Yeah. Or, and, uh, travel permits. I, I, travel permits. And, I mean, and you, you could, and uh, they, yeah, they, so, just, so they were just, just trying so to if, hold the sport down. So no, want, they were trying to control the sport. Control. If you wanted to run in Boston, you, you, had, had, to get a, a you had to get a permit to go there. Isn't that amazing? And a medical <laughs> certificate. And you had to be a paid up member of the AAU. But, if you remember in Boston, they used to give you a medical at the starting line. Yeah. And Ted Corbett failed it one year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then he finished, I don't know, he finished in the top, top ten. ten. You know? Well, then there was that other year when Kirikides, the, the Greek, they, they, they looked at him before and they thought he was too skinny because he was so unmarried. <laughs> this was 1946 because he'd been suffering the famine and then he won the race. Yeah. <laughs> One thing about that is, is that we're talking about the restrictions of the AAU. That's what this film is all about, yes. and and, and tell, talks a lot about what you know. We were all involved with in New York. This is free to run, and it's about freeing ourselves from all of those restrictions and just come on. I just want to run, you know. That's right. And get That's off, right. get That's off the track, onto the road, into the trails, do crazy things, and and explore the world. That's, and so this, that's this film takes about. four major pioneers. Catherine's one of them from the, from the women. Fred Lebo is another from yes. starting off this, right, this right. whole thing. Gary features and, A little bit, and yeah. tells how, how this affected <laughs> the New York world. Uh, and then Steve Prefontaine, the great Yes. track runner, and then a Swiss called Noel Tamini, who started a magazine and was a great believer in running outside. It's a marvelous film that catches this sense of getting this greater freedom. And I wanted to ask you, Gary, when talking, talking about that, reading about the early days, I was reading Fred Lebo's book, and your marathons, well, all your races went round and round and round Yankee Stadium. 
No, no, oh, no. Right. There, there was uh, there was a couple of years that, but they started there in McCombs Dam Park, which was a uh -huh. you know a, a locker room. Uh, so some of them did run around uh, Yankee Stadium, but most of them ran on uh, on the road, right next to the uh, Major Deacon on the service road of the Major Deacon. Uh -huh. uh, most of the distance runners ran there, and they had. All, you know, if uh, you were going to run uh, 20 kilometers, you had to do the four, you know, the four mile loop. And then if you were going to do another one, you had to do the five mile loop and a four mile loop. Uh, it was, um, but it was, most of the races were on Sedgwick Avenue, right next to, you know, on the, uh, the Major Deacon service road. And it was sort of like an abandoned uh, I mean, it, it was abandoned at the time. So I there mean, wasn't it was, much traffic. Right? There was very little traffic. Yeah. Ah. It was a hilly. It was, it was challenging, but that's where most of the races won. There were a few established marathons, well, I mean, there was Yonkers. Usually about a month after Boston. Yes, yeah, the second oldest marathon in yeah. America, that's right. Uh, so Yonkers, well-established marathon, and one, one of the major marathons in America. But, oh, yes. but through, on a hilly course. Well, very, again, very hilly. The Yonkers marathon was, uh, not pretty. came down Route 9 on, yeah. it was very, very hilly, especially the last nine miles. Fred's book describes how he had the idea that they should be running in Central Park. And so, so when you mentioned the Earth Day Marathon, so that was in Central Park. So, yes. that's, so that must have been the first that did that. Well, uh, I think the Earth Day Marathon was after the Cherry Tree Marathon. Yes, it was. Uh -huh. It was like, sort of like took that, took that place. Yeah. So the church, did that go in Central Park, Cherry Tree? No, Marathon? Cherry Tree was on Cedric Avenue, oh. right next to the Major D. Even though there were no cherry trees? No. See, I think was that because it was, it was on Washington's birthday or something? Who oh, no, knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what I think it was, it was on Washington's sort of, birthday. I, that's, I read that yeah. somewhere, Gary, anyway. Yeah. So, Fred right. wanted to bring the marathon to the people. He wanted crowds. He wanted, he wanted attention. He was a promoter. Yes. He wanted Fred attention. Fred was a promoter. Yeah. Yes, without a doubt. He wanted attention. He wanted it in the city. He says, who's going to watch it out in Sedgwick Avenue? People want to watch it in Central Park. Yeah, so he had this vision of, of people being interested, people watching. Promoting. Which, of course, is what had happened in those very early days that I talked about, when they had those marathons coming in from Stamford, and they had huge crowds mm -hmm. along Central Park South. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, so, Gary, when, tell us about some of the, the kinds of running that you, do, you did, because you must also run cross-country, because... Yeah, well, uh, that Van was, Cortland Park was important. Van Cortland Park was, you know, in the in the uh, in the fall, and uh, that was a hilly course, and that's where they had all the cross country races, and then, uh, and then they went to the roads, which was, you know, most of the time was uh, on Cedric Avenue. They used the locker room, the men's locker room, to give out all the prizes, even though it was women in the race. Uh -huh. Nina was, you know, she spent some of her time in the men's locker room at the end <laughs> of the race. Uh, it was all. <laughs> Well, you used to change. I'm always hearing when every every time we go up to Utica or Syracuse or something, there's always people up there who claim that Catherine had changed in the back of their car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's so, another fallacy <laughs> in running, and that is, if all the people who got splinters running at the armory when it was a wood floor got splinters, there would be no wood left. Because oh. <laughs> everybody I think who has run there says they they've got they, they've gotten splinters. Yeah. So this is. Was that there was indoor track back oh, there then? There was indoor course. track. Yes. See, that's again something we forget because that's so small now. We forget just or just building up again with the army, yeah. of course. Mm. Um, fortunately. Well, we ran there when I was in high school. Aha! Uh -huh. So you you, you it, ran at high school? Yeah. So you ran you ran indoors in the winter. You ran what a cross country in the fall, was right. that right? And, and indoors in the winter at the armory. Yeah. Okay. So that's the whole pattern. I mean, I know about the cross country, and I yeah. always think that histories of running these days leave out cross country because when I, when I started, that was the main sport. It is. The, it's cross one of the was greatest the, was sports. It's a really big deal. It, it's, it's one of the yeah. greatest sports. It's out in the open. It's uh, you know in, in nature, and it's in a park, and you're running hills, and you're running yeah. under the trees. I, I like that the best. I loved it, and partly because it was an individual sport. It was you against the competition, it was you against nature, but it was also a team sport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the teams were really important to us in our cross-country races. And people running around Central Park now in these big mob races, they, they, don't, they don't have that. It, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't, mean, it mean anything. Give us one quick vivid memory from the early days before 1976, okay. some, some moment. Okay, 1972, when we came into the finish line of the Crazy Legs Mini Marathon, instead of a finish line tape, the whole thing was big paper. 
You had to burst through it. <laughs> Everybody? No, just the winner. <laughs> just the winner. But, but still, she didn't know what to do. And they said, run through it, run through it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gary, winning the New York Marathon 1970. We've yeah, got to make sure that people appreciate that you did that. And yeah, how, well, how, how four times that around was. Central Park. And yeah. uh, I think one of the vivid memories I have was Moses Mayfield, who was from Maryland area, was in the lead. And uh, he was pretty far out in front. And when I passed them up by the north end of the park, I was going so much faster than him that the bicycle riders that were leading him said, no, nah, that guy isn't in the race. He's, he's running much too fast. Ah. <laughs> Amazing. Uh -huh. yeah. But then you caught him. Well, I caught him and passed him. I, I passed him. The, bike, the bicycle rider said to him, don't worry about it. He's not, he's not in the race. He's running too, too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so re running hasn't changed. The, the essence is yes. you need to pace you it right. One, and, and you put one foot in front of the other. It's a very simple thing. Yeah. But what we've tried to get today is, is some account of this mystery of how the most unlikely place in the world, a city that consists entirely of giant concrete canyons with narrow streets all loaded with traffic and jammed with people, how that for a considerable period, in fact for two periods in its history, was the great generator and the, 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 the center and the great inspirer and the creator of the modern running movement. And New York was really remarkable yes. in, so in doing that. This whole combination of fascinating characters from, from Ted Corbett to, to Fred Lebo and to both of you contributing to that. Um, well, I think the most important was uh, Frank Shorter, Bill Rogers and Fred Lebo. Yes. And then Bill Rogers and Mickey Gorman and running that 1976 New York City Marathon, which features in, in that film. But no marathon can match the vitality of the city. He could create an event that appealed to millions of people, whether you ran or whether you watched. That was Fred's genius. And that's where I said we were going to end today, uh, because that's where everything else starts. That's, that's where we end. Thank you both very much, and thank you, Will Sanchez, for inviting us today. Thank you. Thank you. We were happy running just uh, every Sunday meeting with people and running races and antlers on and, and, and I'm going, well, what happened to my sport?